what interests me uh, is uh, navigation, which is uh, one of very important function that uh, that the olfactory system needs to perform. And in particular, I'm interested into navigation because this is how uh, odors look like in the real world. They're not very simple. We've heard this concept several times during this conference. Um, Turbulence is the norm in the environment. It's always there. And so um, finding the source of an order is uh, a very complex problem. And so uh, I'm going to tell you about uh, behavior and physics and uh, try to make a sense of how these two come together and try to put numbers into what's easy and what's complicated and why something is easy and why something is complicated. Uh, and I want to tell you right away that all of these, uh, uh, the experiments that I'll show, uh, um, that's the work of David Goyer and uh, uh, Venki Murti, and this is when David was a, uh, a postdoc in Venki's lab. Uh, so I acknowledge them, and when I'll say we did this, it's always they, so please remember this. Um, okay, and so the outline of the talk is very simple. I'll give you a very brief introduction. And then I'll go into the data, and then um, I'll tell you something about the physics of the odor that we are uh, delivering to these animals, and then uh, I'll go back to data and try to make sense of, of, of what we see. Um, okay, so this is a very famous experiment that you probably all saw before. If you did, please complain, so we'll skip to the next slide. I remind you what this is. Uh, I really like it, so I'm very happy that, <laughs> that I have to remind you. Uh, so this is a 1939, and it's Tolman and, and co-authors. And what he did is uh, he put a rat uh, here at the start of this maze, and the rat would go into this circular maze, and he would explore and get bored very quickly, and then go on the other side and explore the, the arm, and at the end of the arm, there would be food. Um, he did this for uh, a little while, and then uh, <clears throat> the next day, the rat <coughs> comes back, and what comes out is, um, is the following. <laughs> what happened? Um, well, whatever. I don't know. <laughs> probably, probably. Well, but... the administrative chart that <laughs> 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 Anyways, in this case, at least we learned something very important. So, in this case, we learned something very important, which is that when the rat the next day comes back and it explores the maze, the only arm that he was used to is is blocked, and uh, and so and so then, what do you think the rat did? What what arm did he explore first? But if you know the answer, don't. Don't answer. Can you guess? What do you think? Did he go to 9 and 10 because well, they're closer? <laughs> <laughs> or bang the head very hard against this closed wall? That's possible. <laughs> Any other guess? <laughs> Back to the start? Probably the monitor is saying next time. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Anything else? Well, so the, the answer was very interesting because the rats went to the arm number seven with a, to a, ver with a very high probability, which this was the very first you know, indication that we have a map of space. And this is, I think, for a physicist, the, the fact that there is a map of space. And then after this, a bunch of behavioral experiments. And then we now know a lot about the neural correlates, where it's the, this map of the space is held. This is really interesting. And, and in fact, olfaction is one of the ways we can construct this map of space. These are very recent results. And, and so I, I really like to start with this. But in fact, navigation for navigation, we don't only need to know where we are in space. We also need to know where uh, things are and make decisions as to uh, what's our best shot as get, to get to the, nice, to, to, to the place we want to go. To the target. You are not a rat, so, so rats are very smart.
Why to the left? No, but he's much smarter because he knows this is a shortcut. <laughs> that he's even smarter than you. <laughs> I mean, I've got to say part of the reason why I think navigation is cool is because I'm really, I, I cannot do it and if Google Map wasn't there, I could never do it. So I understand that we may have problems, but rats are really good and in fact, Moths are even better. We've heard this over and over and over. They are able to use these airborne plumes, so complicated plumes, to get to the female. This is the male moth. And the female is very far away, and it's emitting very uh, few molecules. And in fact, it looks like the moth is not only able to, um, to use information from these complex um, uh, turbulent plumes, it's used to it, so it, it's able to respond to it. So if you give it some artificially smooth uh, signal, it actually gets confused. So he doesn't, this is what's represented in this beautiful paper, it gets confused and it, it doesn't go straight, it, it starts to uh, move around. So the very simple question that we ask, so there's a lot known about insects as, as we know, as we've just heard, very beautiful work. And in fact, what we asked the first time that we, we talked with uh, Vanky and David is, well, do rodents, are, are a rodents able to use these airborne plumes, right? Somebody uh, before said this is relevant for mice because mice use airborne plumes. In fact, there are not uh, a whole lot of evidence that um, uh, mice use airborne complex plumes because usually the way we do the experiments are we deliver the odor right next to the nose or we don't even pay attention to how we deliver the odor or um, we don't want to test directly this, uh, this idea. So we set out to ask this first very simple question, and this is the way we decided to do it. Um, this is a box, it's a, about half meter, it's a cube, and it's transparent. And we have three locations. We, remember, have three locations. One, two, three. At each location, there are two tubes. One tube delivers odor, and the other one de delivers odor. Uh, sorry, odor and water. Okay, so the uh, mice are thirsty and so they want to, uh, to get water. And so then we switch on one of the three sources of the odor. At each time, is it, it's a different one. It's a pseudo-random um, uh, number. Um, and uh, when we open the, the odor, the, the valve for the odor, we also open the valve for the water. So as soon as the mouse gets to the correct source of the odor, it can drink, okay? And it's thirsty, so it's encouraged to do it as fast as possible. And we repeat this over and over and over. Uh, there is an inflow and there is an exhaust, so the air motion is pretty complicated um, in, the, in this box, and this is the, the matter of the second part of the talk. Okay, so do, this is the structure, the temporal structure of, of the task. There is a pre-order period, which is about half a minute, uh, half a, a minute, where there is no odor, no water, and then we switch on odor and water for 20 seconds. Okay, so at most they'll drink for 20 seconds. Okay, this is uh, the scheme of the of the arena, and the question is, do do mice do it? Uh, and in fact, so this is a slightly different version of the arena where the uh, odor and the water are not delivered exactly at the same place, but for, for all of the data, we, they're actually co-localized. So what you're... Yeah, there are three sources, sorry. The, all of the sources are at, this, at the... So the flow rate uh, at the, from the vent is huge. It's one meter per second and it's a 10, 10 centimeter. And from below, it's much smaller. It's like, a, um, it's few centimeters, it's few tenths of centimeters. It's not that, that much smaller per second, the velocity, but the, uh, the size of the source is very small. It's uh, um, a few millimeters, mm, much less. It's a few mini it's a few millimeters uh, the the diameter of the of the tube, and so this uh, 
this is a movie of, of a mouse performing the task. And what we've, you, you've seen is uh, uh, green dots appearing as soon as the order went on. And I'll show it again. So a green dot appears as soon as the order is delivered. And uh, a blue dot appears as soon as the mouse gets there and it starts leaking. This is under infrared, and the other thing that uh, we did is um, we uh, put the, the valves for opening the, the, um, the, different, um, the different sources very far away from, uh, from the box so that they couldn't uh, have uh, cues, yeah, auditory cues uh, to decide. Okay, so, and it turns out that the mouse uh, actually sniffs in the air and does the task and performs pretty well. And what you're looking at here is red um, director, uh, red uh, trajectories are the ones that from a location go directly to the right source. And blue trajectories are ones that are um, a little longer and go check the wrong source first and get to the correct location later. And this will be important for later. Okay, so um, let's quantify performance. And this is the first quali qualitative way of quantifying performance. This is the first day. Uh, so the mouse uh, has never seen the task before. Uh, he doesn't know what to do. And what you're looking at, it, each line here is, uh, is one trial. And there is a black dot at each time that the uh, mouse is at the correct location. Order is on here and it's off here. So these are 20 seconds, and this is the pre-order period. Okay? And so you can see that the mouse is at the correct source location independently on whether the order is on or off. It doesn't know the task yet. But then eventually, after uh, several days of, uh, of training, they get it right very fast. So you can see, if you follow one of these uh, trials, they, are, they get to the, so as soon as you, get, um, you, you put the order on, they get to the correct source location in very few seconds, and they stay there consistently until the end. Okay. So let's re-plot this uh, this information in a in an easily uh, readable way. So this is the time at target as a function of days of training, and we can see that the mice learn pretty fast how how to do the task. Uh, this is the other number that I'll use to quantify their behavior, although there is no punishment uh, when they uh, get to the wrong location first. So there's no reason for them to get it right at the first time, but it will be important for the end. Uh, so already early in training, 80% of the time, they get to the correct location first in 80% of the time. Okay, uh, so... The answer to the first question is yes, uh, mice are able to use these complex odors coming from the air. Uh, and the next question, of course, is how? What is their strat navigation strategy? How can they do this? And in order to answer this question, we need some physics. Uh, so these are numerical simulations. So what I did here is uh, I simulated the Navier-Stokes equations, which are the equations that govern how air moves, and uh, um, together with the Navier-Stokes equations, I integrated the equation of a lot of particles to see where they would go. They would start from the source, and then they would go around transported by this flow. And, and this allows me to reconstruct what's the concentration of the odor at each point in space and time. And these movies are the results. Yeah, yeah, so what you're looking at here is this is the, um, a top view, and it's a mouse nose. So you have here is the inlet, and here is the out, it's the vent, right? And the, the uh, source of the odor is at the ground. And I'm, cross, I'm cutting this, uh, this volume at the height of uh, one centimeter where the, the mouse would be, would be sniffing. And here are side views. This is on uh, a cross cut into this plane, and this is on this plane. Okay. And what you see is that it fluctuates, which is the, the bottom line. You can do much more. You can be much more quantitative on how much it fluctuates, and this is what uh, physicists like to do, write 
down equations and find out, analyze this, uh, these signals and see how the correlations go and the structure functions. And I'm not going to tell you more about how to quantify this, this signal, but I want to analyze why um, and how uh, one is able to get to the source of the order in this situation. So I'll tell you something about the physics which is related to this, this stuff. Okay, um, so uh, the first thing, so we've heard even in this conference that uh, mice are able to measure gradients, and this is uh, very clear, you know, we've heard Tim's talk uh, before, they're able to, uh, to measure gradients in two dimensions with a signal, a signal sniff, so how far can you go just measuring gradients? So what I, I did is I took all of those snapshots of the order at the height of the nose of the mouse. And then uh, I designed a very simple uh, algorithm. I am a searcher. I start from a random location and I take a random direction and I go until I find the order. When I find the order, I move in the direction of the gradient. I climb the gradient of the order. And I do this at a, at a constant speed and at, uh, at a constant sampling rate. Okay. And this is the results. So you don't see here, but this is the whole, these are a way to represent the, uh, the scalar, but it's too, too um, it's almost white, so you don't see it, but <laughs> there is the scalar, the, the order uh, behind. And what you see is that uh, the walker eventually, the searcher eventually gets to the, to the source of the order. Yeah, so I, I took numbers that would fit the physiological, um, yeah, so the, um, everything fits, like the volume of, uh, of air that the mouse inhales corresponds to the resolution that I'm um, using for my simulation, and the time scale, I've already said, it's sampling at a constant uh, rate, which is uh, physiological, so measure. So th this is, everything is physiological. And the time scale that I allow uh, the searcher to find the source is 20 seconds, which is the time scale that we use for the experiments. So it turns out, so if you look at these uh, trajectories, you can see that the, the algorithm converges because it's a biased random walk. So I'm moving in random directions, but eventually I'm drifting towards the source. And so we can put numbers on this and try to understand why, uh, where is the signal, and uh, uh, whether, um, how long this, uh, how, how, how effective this uh, algorithm is. And in order to do this, uh, well, first of all, When they encounter the, the plume, they measure the gradient right there, instantaneous gradient at that location, and then they follow the direction of the gradient. They climb of the, of the order, of the order concentration. No, 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 instantaneous, so they, they are spatially, it's a gradient, it's a spatial gradient. We don't know what mice are doing, but we, we know that they can measure, well, yeah, we don't know if that's an instantaneous uh, gradient. Yeah, you're right, you're right. So mice may, may be doing something else. It goes at a constant velocity, and it samples at constant velocity. So the step length, every seven hertz, it's at seven hertz. Uh, if it was just a line, yeah. that it, then it wouldn't okay. go. It, it so would it really be. Rely on some yeah, it it relies on the fact that the the it can measure gradient. Okay. So it means that the the order concentration in the location where he is and in the nearby locations is non-zero. Um, okay, so it works because, uh, as you can see, as soon as you find the plume, then you do this uh, bias random walk. And why do you do a bias random walk? Because uh, the probability of moving a step closer to the source 
is larger than the probability of moving away from the source. And how can we quantify this? Well, this is, sorry, this was a um, quantifying performance of the algorithm, which is comparable with uh, the performance of mice in between five and eight days of training. And we'll talk more about this. Uh, but so back to why does it work? Let's quantify this, uh, this bias, which is the reason why this algorithm works. Um, so in order to quantify this bias, I focus on this angle. So what is this angle? If I'm a searcher and I'm here, and this is the location of the source, that is the direction that I really would like to move. Okay? And this, let's say that I'm here at a certain time, and I measure the gradient, and the gradient points in this direction. If this angle is pretty small, that means that if I follow the gradient, I'm, I don't exactly go in the direction of the source, but I'm still moving closer to the source. These are small angles are good. They move me closer to the source. But if the situation is this one at the next time step, and I follow the gradient, this is really bad because this angle is big and I'm moving away from the source. Okay, so this whole thing works if small angles are more probable than large angles. So let's quantify the, um, the distribution of these angles. Uh, this is the histogram for the two sources. Red is the source when the source is coming from the right, and blue is when the source is coming from the left. They are not uh, symmetrical, so the probability distributions are, are different. And you can see that like, qualitatively that small angles are more probable than large angles. And now we want to put numbers and to put a number and quantify how much this bias is. We have to calculate the area below these two portions of uh, the histogram. This area represents the probability that I move closer to the source following the gradient. And this area represents the probability that following the gradient, I move away from the source. The difference between the two is my bias. If this bias is larger than zero, then I'm in business. Okay, so I can calculate this for my simulations, and it turns out that there is a bias that is non-zero, and for the source coming from the left, the bias is 0 0.18. I can do repeat the same for the source coming from the right, and the bias is slightly less, but it's still non-zero. And this is the correct org order of, of magnitude to account for the time scale that I need to converge uh, in this uh, in this algorithm, so this is the reason why um, the algorithm works, and this all seems very nice. But if you've heard anything about navigation in turbulence, you should be thinking, why does it work? And in fact, it doesn't work at a hundred meters different uh, distance. It only works close by, close to the source, when I'm essentially within the plume. And this is the way I quantify this property. This is the bias now as a function of the distance from the source. And the bias is positive and large when I'm close to the source, but it decays pretty rapidly, actually, as I move away from the source. So the algorithm will fail at about 30 centimeters or 40 centimeters from the source. I just don't see it because my, my box is uh, half a meter in size. OK, but we, we can still learn things from, from this simple example. OK, uh, so uh, how about this, uh, this algorithm? Can I make it better in a simple way? And if you talk to anybody who does uh, uh, stochastic optimization, they'll tell you just average, because uh, averaging um, improves the rate of convergence of uh, stochastic subgrading algorithms. And, and so this is what I did here in an idealized case. I took the, um, the average uh, over a window and of the, all of my snapshots, and I took the new frame, which is now much smoother than the original frames, and I computed the algorithm using this new, smoother version of, uh, of uh, the order. And what it turns out is that performance does improve, and it's pretty, um, it's noticeable. It's not a huge, but it is a, a good improvement. Except mice, if they wanted to average, they would have to compute this average. So nobody gives them the average, which is what normally happens if you, uh, if you do stochastic 
gradient algorithms on, on that data set. You can use your data set as much as you want, but mice would have to sample the order and pause and stay there for a little while for their time window and average the signal. And so if you do that, then it turns out that it's never good to, to average. So the message of this slide is that it tends to be much better to just get a signal, make a move, and it's never worth it to try to make it better, to make it more reliable. Okay, and, and, and so this concept of uh, getting the signal and move is really important. And it turns out this is what limits performance uh, in this algorithm. And, and we can give a name to this uh, getting a signal. It, it's called intermittency. And it's what I'm trying to explain in the next slide. So this is a condensation of, the, of, of two movies. Uh, one comes for, for the source coming from the left and one from the right. Okay, and in each box, there is the time series of the signal at that location. Okay, and this, it doesn't matter what the numbers are, so I didn't put any number because I don't care right now. I want to show you a very simple qualitative uh, property of the signals. So this is uh, uh, roughly where the source is. And let's look at this, uh, the signal in these boxes right downstream from the source. Okay. So I magnified them here, and what it turns out is that the signal there fluctuates a lot. It goes up and down, but it's always there. So I always get the signal, okay? But if I move away from the source, now I'm magnifying the, uh, the signal in these boxes that are far away from the source. They are actually at the boundary of the plume. What you see here, these are vertical lines, and vertical lines in the a log lean plot mean that the signal is actually zero. In a, in all of the time interval, intervals in between uh, two vertical lines, the signal is zero. And this is intermittency. It means that sometimes you get the signal, but then there are long periods of time where you don't get the signal. And this is what really hard in, in, in navigation in turbulent environments is that several times you don't get anything. So you don't know what to do because you don't get anything. Okay. It's not the fact that it fluctuates, because there is a little bit of signal when it fluctuates. It's just when you don't get anything, what do you do? That's, the, that's what makes it hard to navigate toward um, in, in turbulent environments. OK, and, and I, I can, in this simple environment, I can prove that this is what limits performance of the algorithm. I can tell you that. The, the two sources, as I said, are slightly uh, different. They're not uh, symmetrical with respect to the center. This source is slightly closer to the midline. So it is more turbulent, more complicated, but it turns out that the plume that it generates is larger. So the first encounter happens earlier than for the other, than for the other source. So notice that the bias towards this source is smaller. Okay, so this sort, the gradient in this case is less re reliable. But I get the signal much earlier, so I, I, I have more time, so I have more moves to get there. And this makes this source easier to track than this one, okay. which is what I'm saying here. This is harder to track, although it's more reliable. And the reason is that I get the signal later. Okay, so intermittency is, is, is really what's hard in turbulence. Okay, um, so now let's go back to, to the data. And uh, as I said before, so the, the um, um, performance of the algorithm is similar to the performance of the animals in this stage of training. So they're not naive, but they're not at their best. But then the, the curve keeps improving, the mice get better. And why do, we, do they get better? This is the, the new question. Turns out that they get back better because they cheat. Okay? They start to do something that we didn't ask them to do. Um, so the first thing that I wanted to show is that they get better, so they get faster at locating the source of the order, but they get it wrong uh, several times, much more than before. Okay, so late in training means bet between 14 and 18 days of training. They're very fast because they are at the order source for 
an average of 16 seconds. So they get there on average in four seconds, but they get it wrong several times. They check the, the wrong location first in a high percentage of the trials. Okay? And the other thing that's interesting is that late in training, they stop thinking. They just go like crazy. Their velocity increases and the number of pauses decreases. Okay? So we thought about this for a while and then we came up with the following. So we analyzed a little bit the, the trajectories and it looks like the trajectory early in training is much more wiggly and the trajectory late in training is much more smooth. And, and they are sort of less complex. This is a, just a way of saying that the, they explore less, uh, less space. And the idea that we got is maybe early in training, they have no idea where the sources are. They have to rely on the order to locate the source of the order. But late in training, because the sources are in those three locations, then they know where the locations are. They just go in circles and they check all of the sources sequentially until they find it, the, the right one. So the model that we had in mind is the following. When early in training, when you have no prior and source location, your trajectories have to span more of the space and you have to be more careful. You have to actually sample and use the order plume. Late in training, this is not what happens. They switch completely behavior and they just go from one location to the next sequentially. Okay? This would explain why they don't pause anymore because they don't need to. Their trajectories are stereotyped. And it would also explain why um, their, their performance improves in terms of time because they can go like crazy. They don't have anything to compute. They just go like crazy and it will be very fast. Uh, during, you, yes, so I think what you are asking is this, is this what you're asking? So if the, the model is correct, then we would predict that if we train another set of mice in, on another set of locations, and then we move, suddenly move the locations, that means that they are trained, they know the association between water and odor, but suddenly they have no prior on source location anymore. And if this is the case, then they should switch back to a behavior that's more similar to when they're early in training. Is that what you're asking? Okay, so that's what we did. We, we trained this other set of mice on locations A, B, and C, and then at 18 days of training, when they were very good, the blue curve is how long they stay at the correct source location late in training, they move the, we move the, the locations to one, two, three, and we test them again. And the performance drops just a little bit, okay? But let's see about the behavior. So this is how it looks like. So I, I wrote prior in big when uh, late in training, all of the behavior is uh, uh, expected to depend on the prior, and prior is very small when the, all of the behavior should depend on the order. And uh, uh, our prediction is that early and moved, because there is very little prior, should be similar. And late should be different. Okay, so as I said, late in training, they are careless. And these are, this is the new set of mice, and they are careless as the previous set of mice. But as soon as we move the locations, they have no idea where they are. They are careful again. Okay. This is the same uh, uh, data represented with uh, colorful trajectories, so there is no new content here. And this is the last, uh, the last uh, number that, will, um, that I wanted to show you. Uh, late in, in training, we, we said they don't need to pause at all. They can go very fast. Uh, but if I move the locations to unknown locations, they don't know where they are, they cannot check them sequentially, so they have to pause again and to go slow again. And this mode condition looks very much like this early condition in both the velocity and the pauses per sec. Okay? So I think I might, uh, I might have a figure 
uh, later. It, so if you look at uh, the probability distribution of um, presence, it looks like for at least the first couple of days, they, they go check the, the old locations, and then eventually they, they forget. They, they understand that the locations are new, and they give up with the, with the old location. It takes a while, though. It's not immediate. Um, okay, so if this is the situation, then our uh, our algorithm should correlate well with the early and mood behavior, but not with the late one. Okay, late one should be completely uncorrelated. It should not care about the order at all. And so this is the analysis that I want to uh, I want to present here. So. This is the performance of the gradient climbing algorithm as a function of the uh, location of the start. Okay, so it's a representative in color code. When I start very far away from the source, I'm only at the target for a few seconds. But when I'm very close to the source, then uh, I'm at the target for a long, for a long time, so almost, uh, uh, almost 20 seconds. And these are uh, the performances of the two data sets that I just told you about, the early and the mood conditions. In these two conditions, um, the prior on source location is very small. So I expect this to be well explained by, uh, to correlate well with this uh, algorithm, or better. And these are the results. So I, I show you two numbers here. This is the difference in performance tracking the right and the left source and as I said this the, the two sources are different different because they are not uh, symmetrical with, with respect to, to, to the center but this only holds when you actually care about the order okay so these all three uh, three data sets care about the order and all of them uh, track easier the the source on the right than the source on the left because of the reasons we discussed before. Okay. And the other number I wanted to show is the partial correlation coefficient between this map and this map. And there is some correlation. Now, if I add this data set, this data set you can tell already qualitatively is completely diff it's qualitatively different from the other, the other data sets. This is late in training, and the performance does not depend on whether you're getting the order or not. It's it, even the symmetry is circular. It's because they're running in circles. So that's the way, that's what defines the performance of these animals. It's the distance from the source in this trajectories, in this space. Okay? And in fact, this uh, data set does not show any preference toward the right or the left. You track as easy the right and the left because they are on the same trajectories. It doesn't change anything. And uh, uh, this data set is much less correlated with the, the early and mood condition, the, the gradient climbing condition. Okay, um, so now to test further this idea that late in training they don't rely on the order but they rely on their prior, what we do is uh, uh, we design a new algorithm that is based on the following. We took uh, the foraging uh, trajectories when there is no order around. And because they hang out more around the location of the sources, we take these trajectories as proxies of their prior onto source location. Okay? Uh, so we take each of these trajectories and uh, we ask how long along these trajectories it takes to get to the correct source location, and we plot the map of, uh, um, of performance as a function of where I start. Okay? So instead of taking the gradient climbing trajectories, they just take other trajectories that are just a proxy of, of their prior and source location. And, and so this clearly doesn't care about the order at all, and it cares a little bit about uh, the prior. It only cares about the prior. Uh, and now it turns out that this, again, shows no preference towards one source or, or the other, because they are completely symmetrical. And, uh, um, and the situation is now reversed. If I try to correlate this new algorithm with the early mood condition that are not based on prior, they are based only on, on, uh, on the order, it turns out that the correlation is much less 
than with the late condition that is based on prior. Okay, this is a complicated way of uh, trying to test our ideas. I, know, I don't know if I did a good job at explaining, and you feel free to ask questions. Um, the idea is just that either the prior or the sensory input are important for performance, and if you design an algorithm that's just based on the sensory input, it would correlate more with the early and mood conditions where they know nothing about source location. And this is what this is testing. Okay. So this was very short. So the conclusion of the of the talk is first that mice are able to use these complex odor plumes to locate the source of an odor. Second, that uh, although there is turbulence and the uh, the signal is fluctuating, this task can be solved, can be accomplished with a pointwise instantaneous measure of the gradient. And the reason why this is true, it is because we are close to the source. We are in the plume. And so we don't have so much problem of finding the plume and getting the signal because we are all, almost always get the signal. Okay? Uh, and, and so then the next uh, idea of the talk was then if you lead, leave the mice too much in this, uh, in this environment, they try to find um, shortcuts, and they don't want to do this complex computation and, and using the order and computing uh, who knows what, and they start to, to switch into a habitual behavior that doesn't care about the sensory input anymore, but only about their prior on source location. And so I wanted to conclude with uh, what's next, and uh, uh, one of the obvious things that need to be done is move to a larger environment um, and, uh, and, and use sources that are not predictable. And this is to challenge the, the mice, because I, I believe that they are able to do much more than uh, what you are asking them to do, and, and this needs to be tested. And, and the next thing is, uh, uh, if we do challenge them in a much more complex environment where uh, the instantaneous gradient is not enough, what do they do? What do they measure? Right? What are they able to store um, in, in terms of information about this complex signal? There are several things that a physicist could, could think about this, uh, this signal. There is correlations. There is time, uh, time series. There is averages. What do they store? And we know, we've heard it over and over and over, that the, the capacity of, uh, of uh, the nervous system is huge. And the brain can store it pretty much anything uh, in terms of number of, of, uh, of bits. And so if the question is, what is really relevant for complex uh, uh, navigation? And the last thing that, we, that I wanted to mention is that we observed that um, this pauses, and, uh, and it, it doesn't seem that pausing uh, just for averaging is useful. And, and so a question is, why would they actually pause? Why would, would they not keep moving? And it might, the answer might just simply be, well, they, they don't know how to make decisions while they move, or just that they have to take time to sniff and, and process the information. Or maybe there is a, some cognitive load related to making computations that we could actually quantify in terms of uh, numbers of pauses. And with this, I thank David and Venki especially, and uh, Avika Nani, who uh, helped with the experiment, and I thank you very much for your attention.